Amen. Exciting times. Can we give it up? Here we go. Awesome stuff. So, so glad you're here. So glad you're here in this season of the life of our church as God continues to grow us and reach new people for Christ and as we really lean in to put our hearts and heads together to how we can make sure that we're reaching the current generation for Jesus Christ. I mentioned in my little video, my clip in the, in the little video, that one of the, every now and then I'll find myself daydreaming, I don't know if you guys do this, about what would happen if I ever hit one of those super lotto things. I mean, you see it on the news and, and they hit a half a billion dollars, that kind of stuff. And I find myself going down this road of, I would buy this, I would go there, I would do that stuff. But where I really get excited is the idea that if I want a half a billion dollars, then the tithe off of that is, nah, I'm not a math guy, $50 million. What could I do with $50 million? What kind of blessings could I give here at the bridge in this community, in Wayne County, Johnston County, and beyond? What could I do for missions? What could I do around the world? And then I remember you got to actually buy it ticket to do that and I don't know actually how to buy them tickets so I guess that's not in the mix but doesn't do away with my desire my dream to make a difference in this world and I dare say that I'm talking to a group of people who whether you've done the lotto daydream or not you feel the same way I do because here's something I know as we kick off this series. Pastor Luke and I have talked about it. We're going to be talking over the next four weeks to some of the most incredibly generous people on the planet. We know that about you. God has done amazing things through your generosity. We, we are not coming here to try to get you to be generous because you are. But there is a goal for this series, and that simply is this. We want to give you the tools to become the generous people that you want to be. I mean, we've all been in those situations where we saw a need or we saw an opportunity and we wish we could give more to it than we feel like we can, but we just can't see our way clear to do it. And so what we're going to be talking about during this series is real practical nuts and bolts kind of tools, principles that you can follow that'll help you do exactly that. The fact of the matter is, you're generous people, but Americans are generous people. I did some research this week just to update the information, and I discovered that, that last year alone, 2021 in America, uh, Americans gave $484.85 billion to charity, and 73% of that came from individuals didn't come from big corporations, that kind of stuff. The vast majority of that came from individuals. And here's the thing, the, the detail that shocked me the most and surprised me and excited me the most is that 97% of that individual giving came from people that made less than $60,000 a year. You are an incredibly generous group of people. So please understand from the beginning of this series, uh, Luke and I know we're talking to generous people and our goal is not to get you to become generous. Our goal is to help you enjoy the generosity that God has put in your heart by uh, helping you to learn the tools that'll help you to get there. I see there's only two ways to become as generous as you want to be. One would be to learn God's principles and start to apply them more and more and more. The other way would be to reach into the pocket beside you and give the way you always wanted to. I don't know if you prefer the second way or not, but let's assume that that one gets you in trouble. So let's lean into some principles uh, this, uh, during this month, okay? Is that worth some time? Let's lean into it because ultimately, not only when you apply God's principles does it help you to become more generous, but it helps you to meet your family's needs as well, and it helps you to prepare for the future that God has for you. So we're going to talk about ways to relieve the stress that's associated with finances. I've read before that the number one stressor in marriages that end in divorce was money. Fighting about money was the number one uh, problem that they had to deal with. So we're going to give you some tools to help you relieve some of those stresses. So this series um, won't just help you be more generous. It may happily, uh, actually help your marriage in amazing kinds of ways. We're going to talk about how to get on the right side of the interest equation. In other words, to get on the side where you are earning interest rather than spending interest or paying interest. We're going to talk about how to get a life-work balance so that you can enjoy 
the life that God has given you. Today, I just want to kind of set it up by showing you what I understand to be the five levels of giving that the Scriptures talk about, actually four that the Bible talks about, and a fifth one that I've acknowledged and and noticed over the years. I'm going to show you the journey, and I want to challenge you to kind of take an honest look at where you are in this journey to, uh, to be the generous people God's called us to be, all the way to level five, which is giving as a genuine act of worship. Is that worth a few minutes of our time? Five simple levels. Let me just kind of lay them out for you. Take notes if you want to. Go to the Bridge NC app and pull up the notes. They're there. You can save them to your journal and write your own notes if you want to. I can give you these, these notes. I'll give you my notes if you want. Just email us at info at bridgechurch.cc. I'd be glad to provide those notes for you for your own research and purposes, but let's get into it. Level one <coughs> is what I call the consumer giver, the consumer giver, the consumer giver. I had a guy come to me several years ago now. He was a businessman in the community. He was in his 40s, and, uh, <coughs> and he had just recently come to Christ. And he came to me one day and said, Pastor, 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 I, I got an idea. And he was so excited he could hardly get the words out. He said, I got that idea. I got this idea. This place is so awesome, people would pay to be here. So here's my idea. If we charge $10 at the door for each adult, and $5 for each kid, and $2 for parking, we'd have plenty of money to do all the things that we want to do as a church. And he was so excited, and understand, he didn't know or care anything about biblical giving. He just loved what he saw, loved his experience, and he wanted to contribute in the only way that he knew how. And and if you think about it, um, we kind of get where he's coming from. Am I right? I and mean, we've all been in organizations that, that you, if you want to play, you've got to pay, right? We, our kids go to sports leagues, and we join clubs and lodges and, and just all kinds of stuff, fantasy football leagues, whatever else. And, and we are willing to kick in a certain amount of money in order to be a part of what's going on. And, and so the result is that we get to be a part of it, and that organization has the money to do what they need to, to do. That's what I call consumer giving. You are a consumer, and you're willing to give in order to be a consumer of that. Fact is, I've known some churches that operate that way. I have. I've known some churches that actually send committees out first of the year. They go into each home, member's home of the church, and they sit down at the kitchen table, and they say, okay, how much are you guys going to pledge next year toward the budget of the church? And they take all those numbers, and they take them back, and they, and they put it together, and that's the budget for the year for the church. And then they got a bulletin board in the hallway, and everybody who pledged and how much they pledged is put on that bulletin board. And then as the year progresses, they show who's keeping up with their pledge and who isn't, and it's just really tracked along the way. Now, you may not ever have heard that, but I have. In fact, I had a a rabbi look at me one one time when I talked about tithes and offerings, and he said, well, how do you get any money at all with that approach? I mean, all he knew was this consumer giving approach to, to things. Some churches even put little brass plaques all over the church for people that gave the most. I mean, it's just this kind of stuff that happens all the time. And, and we understand that. We understand consumer giving. And I'm not here trashing. If you're, if you're consumer giving, then God bless you. Thank you so very much for your gifts. We will do our best to steward that giving to bless people's lives. But I, I think I probably do need to say before we move on, I can't give you a biblical example of this one because the Bible doesn't know anything about consumer giving. The Bible doesn't even talk about consumer giving. But that said, the fact is most of us probably start there. Like the family that I heard of one time who never really went to church, but they, uh, mom and dad decided eventually that, that we probably should raise the kids in church. And, and so they decided to go one Sunday and they went through the service. And after the service, they're driving home and the husband is complaining to the wife the whole time about the music was mediocre and the preacher would, I didn't understand a word he said and the people were not nice. And he just went on and on on complaining. And, uh, and, and then... Uh, the, the little boy, he, he, then the father said, well, you know, they, they actually even passed around a bucket and wanted us to put money in it. I, I, just, I don't know if I'm ever going back to a place like that again. And he heard his little boy in the back seat say, well, you know, Dad, I didn't think it was too bad a show for $2. <laughs> if you're at the consuming uh, level of this, thank you for your giving. We'll use it for God's kingdom. But my prayer is that you'll move beyond that point. 
that you'll move to level two, which I call gratitude giving, gratitude giving. Look at Psalm 116. What can I give the Lord for all the good things he has given me? This level of giving comes when you are personally impacted by what Jesus Christ gave. It begins to register on your heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That means me. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's for me. Jesus gave his life so that I could have life and have that life to the fullness. That's me. And so giving at this level becomes an act of thanksgiving. It becomes an act of gratitude. A practical uh, illustration of that from, from my life is I still remember vividly the first time I went to Washington, D.C. and saw the, the, the Vietnam Memorial Wall. How many of you have ever been to the wall? I don't know if it was an as emotional experience for you as it was for me, but it was incredibly emotional for me because I'm a baby of the Vietnam era. I finished high school in 1970 and, and was prepared to go. Uh, they did a lottery back in those days. Some of you remember the lottery because they were drafting uh, able-bodied men mostly, and, and, and so they did a lottery. And my lottery number was 361. So I got a 1H classification to the draft, which means he's able-bodied, and if we need him, we'll call him, but odds are his lotto number is so high we won't call him. And so uh, that's where I was, but I was ready to go. So when it finally, and I had friends that did go, and I had friends that went and didn't come back. So the first time I went to the Vietnam Wall and I'm walking along the wall, I did what most all of us do when we're in a place like that. I immediately went to the W's. Come on, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I went to see if there were any walls there on the wall. And as I'm on my way to the W's, I ran across the U's and I saw the name Gary Utranian. I grew up my earliest years in Detroit and across the street, my best friend was David Utranian and his big brother's name was Gary. And it just... It just hit me standing there at that wall. That's David's big brother. And he gave his life so that I could enjoy all the benefits of being in a free America. And I stood there at that wall and I traced his name with my finger and I wept like a baby and I looked down the wall and I saw these burly guys in army fatigue jackets, big old rugged looking dudes and they were standing at the wall with their hands on the wall and tears just flowing there's and I understood in that moment there was this deep gratitude that the, that words were not enough to say how grateful we were and are for the sacrifices that some men and women have made in order for us to be free any americans here grateful for the sacrifices that men and women make for us to be free. So many of you are active duty or you're veterans and, and our gratitude to you is extreme. We don't even have words to tell you how grateful we are for you, but it, but it also helps us to, to understand and to illustrate the reality that when it hits you, what Jesus did for you, that he gave up the glories of heaven, he took on the form of a man, and just not, not just a, a man, but a servant, and not just a servant, but he served all the way to death, and not just death, the worst possible death ever devised by man, death by crucifixion, and he gave it all to you so that you could live. And when it hits you that way, then your giving becomes an act of gratitude because there are no words we can sing songs of gratitude and thanksgiving, and we want to and we do, but there are no words. We want a tangible expression. I call it gratitude giving. Then we move from there to the third level of giving, and I'll call that the obedience level. Obedience giving. Jesus actually tells a story in Matthew chapter 8 that kind of sets up what I want to tell you about the obedience giving. As Jesus was entering the city of Capernaum, a, a Roman soldier, an officer, came to him one day and said, 
uh, Jesus, my servant, is back home and he's really, really sick. He's bedridden, he's in pain. Um, and if you will, you can heal him. And Jesus said, okay, well, let me go to your house and, and, and I'll take care of that for you, I'll, I'll heal him. And the officer said, well, thank you. Um, verse eight, Matthew chapter eight, verse eight. Officer answered, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. You only need to command it. And my servant will be healed. He, he went on to say, profoundly, he went on to say, I, I understand authority. I understand how authority works. I, I'm an officer in the military. I know that there are people who have authority over me. And when they tell me to do something, my job is to obey those orders. And I have soldiers that are under me. And when I give them an, an instruction or a direction, an order, I fully expect that order to be obeyed. I understand how authority works. He went on to say in so many words, I know who you are, and I know you have authority over sickness and death, so you don't have to go to my house. You don't have to go do anything. All you have to do is say the word, and sickness and death will obey your words. When Jesus heard those words, he uttered strange response. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. He said to those who were following him, don't, don't gloss over that phrase. He said to those who were following him. One more time, say it with me. He said to those who were following him. Who's he talking to? He's talking to his own disciples. He's talking to the Jews who began to recognize that he is Messiah. He turned to the people who were following him and he said, I tell you the truth, this is the greatest faith I've found even in Israel. He's saying to his own disciples, this guy gets something that I'm not sure you get yet. John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will, what? Obey my teaching. When it comes to giving, there are instructions from the scriptures about how we give. And so at this level, yes, we may start out as consumers and then we eventually move into this gratitude place, but eventually, <coughs> as we mature in the Lord, we come to a level where we say, I'm gonna give the way the Bible says give. I'm gonna give the way the Bible instructs. And there are two very specific instructions that are given to us from scripture. Number one is tithing. Malachi chapter three, verse 10, bring this storehouse a full 10th of what you earn so that there will be food in my house house. So uh, I know some people tell me that, you know, tithing is an Old Testament concept and, and we're not under the law anymore. So we don't have to bother with tithing or do tithing anymore. And my response to that is, okay, you don't know. I, I'm not going to argue that point with you. I do see tithing in the New Testament, but, but here's what I will say. The standard in the Old Testament was 10% and the standard in the New Testament is 100%. You can be a New Testament giver if you want. That's fine with me. I don't, I don't mind a bit in the world. But I do believe the baseline for saying I'm going to obey the Word of God is to bring the tithe. You see our offering envelope, the first uh, line that you see just simply says tithe. And if you're uh, not sure about what all that is, then the tithe is what pays the light bill. The tithe is what pays for this facility. The tithe is what provides supplies for our kids' ministries and beyond. It's the salaries for our staff. It's the equipment that we enjoy. It's the microphone that I'm using to project my voice to you now. It's the cameras that take this message literally to the world. That's what the tithe is for. The second type of giving that the Bible instructs us is called free will offerings. This type of giving dates all the way back to, to Moses' time. Exodus chapter 35, verse 29. I, love, I like the way the message paraphrases it. Every man and woman in Israel whose heart moved them freely to bring something for the work that God through Moses had commanded them to make brought it a, what is it? A voluntary offering for God. So yes, the tithe is that baseline, everybody bring 10%. Uh, offering to the Lord uh, so that there'll be food in my house. Bring it to the storehouse. It's not yours to direct other places. Bring it to the storehouse, which is the place where the food is stored, where your soul is fed. But then there are opportunities uh, beyond the tithe where the Holy Spirit will prompt you from time to time to give to meet a need. Let's be honest. There are lots of needs out there. I thought I'd get an amen. 
I mean, there's a never ending stream uh, of emaciated children and pitiful puppies on TV. I mean, come on, there's just so many needs out there. Sarah McLaughlin singing a sad song. I mean, this all out there that will touch your heart. Uh, there are missionaries who cast vision for what they're doing in their part of the world. I went to the Wayne Pregnancy Center banquet this week and they are doing amazing things. If you haven't plugged into what's going on at the uh, Wayne Pregnancy Center or Cry Freedom Ministries, you ought to learn more about them because it's amazing the things that they're doing that are bringing life to people that are in the deep, deep bondage of sexual sin. And, and crisis pregnancies and, and all kinds of families in crisis. It's amazing what they are doing. But let's be honest, guys, there are so many needs all over the world. We can't, no matter how much we want to, give to them all. So at this level, you begin to understand that every need is not a calling. That sometimes God is calling you to give to a need. Other times he's calling you to pray the Lord of the harvest to bring laborers into that. As you mature in the Lord, you learn to listen to him. You learn to discern his voice. You, you begin to say, well, that's, that's a valid need, but probably not one that I'm going to lean into. Yes, uh, no to that one, no to that one. Yes, well, there's one. I believe that's something God wants me to to get involved in. And so you begin to pray, Lord, give me direction and wisdom how I can give to that need. Kim and I have a simple approach to this. We have for many years as a married couple, when we both find one of those areas that we're passionate about, uh, I'll say, okay, you go pray, I'll go pray. And then we come back together and say, okay, is the Lord giving you a number? And, and if he has, she'll tell me the number. And and, and if I've, he's given me a number, I'll tell her the number. And we come together. It's amazing how many times we've got the same number. But nevertheless, we come together to an agreement. And then we give to that need. For us, here at the bridge, that's the second line on that offering envelope that you see. It's called the Building for the Generations Fund. And that's what we're talking about in the video that you just saw with all of our location lead pastors. And, and so what we're doing is we're gearing up to reach this generation for Christ. And God's doing amazing things as we lean into benevolences and missions, as we, uh, the Hope Center comes online in 2023, which is a residential drug rehab program that's gonna be sponsored right out of the bridge, Princeton, and, and doing construction for kids' ministries and upgrading those ministries, lots of things going on. And we launched that campaign a year ago. For those of you that have come in the last year or somehow missed it last year, you guys, uh, committed, we together committed a million dollars over three years to the Building for the Generation Fund. In fact, just over a million. I just got a report from the bookkeeper this week, uh, and so uh, we are a little less than a third of the way through the three-year campaign, and, uh, and so far, you guys have given 43.5% of the million dollars. <laughs> Praise God. God's doing amazing kinds of things. I realize that many of you, as we talk about this over the next few weeks, you're on track, you're giving. Kim and I automated ours, so it just goes in every month and, and we're excited to be a part of it. Some of many of you are doing that, you're already on track. Some of you perhaps made a commitment last year and you haven't been able to see your way through to do it. Here's your chance to catch up. Some of you have come in in the last year and you weren't a part of that last year. Or maybe you were here, but you were so new you weren't ready to make a commitment. You can get involved and so November 20th, is Commitment Sunday, and we're going to bring our offering that day. We're going to bring our pledges. A newsletter is going to go out soon, and there'll be an offering envelope in there for you to consider as, as we lean forward toward November 20th, all designed to, to build for the generations. And so we're excited about what God is doing. That is obedience-level giving, bringing the tithe and then bringing free will offerings as the Holy Spirit prompts, which leads us to level four giving, which I simply call vision giving. And it's very similar to level three. Uh, the best example I know of is the church at Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter five. Uh, Paul wrote these words, their giving simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their lives. People at this level of giving are giving out of a grace-filled heart. They're giving out of this, uh, this undertaking to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. They've already committed to being an obedience giver, but now they've matured to the point that they actually start to see the world in a totally different way. These givers have come to realize that the world is in trouble and nobody knows how to fix it. Do I need to say that again? 
These givers have come to realize that the world is in trouble and nobody seems to know how to fix it. I got a couple. Yeah. Let me say it one more time. They've come to understand the world's in trouble. Can I get an amen on that one? And so many people in leadership seem to have no clue how to fix it. And these people, but these people have come to realize that the hope of the world is the body of Christ, the local church. Management guru Peter Drucker, who was one of the leading management business uh, gurus in the 20th century, said this late in his years. He was in his 90s, late in the 20th century. And these are the words uh, he said. Most things in the world aren't working anymore. Government doesn't work very well anymore. Business has got all kinds of problems. The educational system's in turmoil, and the health is in crisis. There's only really a couple of places in all of society that have the power to transform human lives. In my remaining years, he said, I'm going to give myself, my expertise, my resources to organizations that are doing something. He concluded, that organization was the local church, the body of Christ. I don't think Mr. Drucker was saying, ignore those things. We, we're called to be salt and light. And of course, we ought to be salt and light in the educational processes. We ought to be salt and light in government and business and healthcare and all those places. We ought to be engaged in that. The elections are coming. Have you guys already started praying? You guys are already reading your scriptures? You're already doing your homework? I walk up on the polling places and, and, and they start sticking their things in my face and I go, thank you for what you're doing. I've done my homework. And what is my homework? My homework is I need to know what the issues are and I need to know what the Bible says about those issues and I need to vote according to scripture. Amen? And if you decide, well, I'm just not going to bother because it won't make a difference, then you've missed the whole point. We are called to be salt and light. And we can make a difference. But at the end of the day, the White House can't change hearts. Congress can't change hearts. Educational system can't change hearts. The only one that can transform a human life is Jesus Christ himself, and we are his body. And so we lean into that. I'm convinced, everything in me, I'm convinced that the local church is the hope of the world. William Bennett, the former education secretary for our country, said it this way, I submit to you that the crisis of our time is spiritual. What afflicts the U.S. as a nation is the corruption of the heart and the turning away of the soul. Nothing has been more consequential in the unraveling of our society than large segments of the American society privately turning away from God. And to turn things around, there must come a widespread personal spiritual renewal. I agree with Mr. Bennett with every fiber of my being, and I don't mind telling you where that belief leads for me. It drives me to direct more and more time and money and resources and talents into the body of Christ because I want to make a difference in my world, in my life. And Kim and I can consider the bridge, Princeton, to be the best place we know to do that. We've committed the rest of our lives. We believe Jesus has called us here uh, to, to commit ourselves to be a part of what he's doing in this church for the rest of our lives. We intend to do it right here because we've caught the vision changing lives that change the world. We believe the mission of our church, which is to connect people to God and his family and, and then to help them grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and then help them to serve as they're being served and then help them to become leaders who reach out to others to connect, grow, serve, and ultimately lead themselves. We're linking arms with the hundreds of you that agree with that and you're leaning into it too. We're praying constantly that hundreds more will join in and become a part of this. And when you do, when you get to that vision level of giving, you do, you, you've been the consumer giver, you've been the gratitude giver, you've been the obedience giver. But now at this phase of your life, vision drives you and making a difference in the world drives you. And I don't mind telling you when you do, giving takes on a whole nother dimension. Praying about what you're going to do and how you're going to give takes on a whole nother dimension. 
it, it, it takes on a, do I really need a newer car? Do I really need a bigger house? Do I really need that vacation? Do I really need these things that don't eternally matter? Or do I need to make a difference with what God has blessed me with, which ultimately leads to level five, and I'll hush. And that's what I simply call active worship giving. Active worship giving. Clear example of this in Luke chapter 7, verse 37. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood beside him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. You got the image? This woman who has been redeemed for a life of sin. She's been set free from the slavery of her own choices, and Jesus Christ has done that for her. And now she has a chance to be in his presence, and everything in her says, I have to worship the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, and she comes in, and with her very tears pouring out her life, she washes his feet, and with her very hair, she wipes them, and then she takes this alabaster jar that some say probably cost something like a year's wages, and she anointed him for the burial that was about to come. The dignified people around her freaked out. They, are, they started crunching numbers. They got their calculators out and started running how much that cost and how much she made and how ridiculous this was. And they made fun of that emotional decision that she had made. They thought she was crazy. You don't have that much money. You don't even have a job right now. You, you, you can buy expensive perfume, but, but you can't, and you just pour it out. What is wrong with you, woman? And I can almost hear her say, you don't understand. I owe him my life. He's worthy of whatever offering I can bring. In fact, I don't bring an offering of money. I don't bring an offering of time. I bring an offering of me. I am the offering, and I'm praying, God, pour my life out like a drink offering before you. There's lots of other examples in the Bible of that. The widow woman who gave her last two pennies, confident God would meet her needs, but she wanted to worship. After Joseph died, Joseph, uh, uh, Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea gave his very grave. That's a little unprecedented, wouldn't you think? He actually said, well, you can have my grave. Pretty unconventional thinking, but he wanted to worship. Of course, he might have been paying attention to Jesus and knew that Jesus wouldn't need it but three days or so, and he could get it back. I don't know, but nevertheless, as an act of worship, he gave that most precious thing when you reach this level, and I got to be honest, I, I haven't known many people that's reached this level over the years. When you get to that level, accountants don't make, don't, can't understand, they scratch their heads. Even spiritually mature say, are you sure that's what God is saying for you to do? You sacrifice precious amounts of time and money to be engaged in the work of God because you want to make it an act of worship. I got to close. But before I do, let me come back to what I said when we started. Nobody's here to guilt trip anybody. Nobody's here to put you in an awkward position. I'm not going to ask you to respond. But I am going to ask you sincerely, as I have been doing all week and preparing to share with you, what level of giver are you? I know I'm talking to givers. I know I'm talking to generous people, both in this room and online. I know that about you. The evidence is clear. The question is, what level are you on? That's between you and God. <clears throat> if you honestly say, well, yeah, I'm probably at the consumer phase. I know church has to have money to operate, and so I'll put a little bit in the plate, or I'll, I'll go digital and, you know, make a, a gift through the, the Bridge app or go to the website or something. I'll, yeah, I'll do that. If that's where you are, God bless you. Thank you. We will be stewards of what you give. But I'm going to ask you sincerely, to consider moving to the gratitude stage of this thing so that your gift is an act of thanksgiving for what Jesus has done for you. And even to move to the obedience level where you say, Lord, whatever instruction you give, I'm going to follow. And if you say start with the tithe, then that's where I'm going to start. If you say give free will offerings beyond that, then I'm going to pray for the direction of the Holy Spirit to where those free offerings go and, and how much they're going to be. For some of you, your prayer becomes, Lord, give me a vision 
of how I can be involved in something that's going to make a difference in the world <coughs> and I can lean into it. That's what <coughs> so many of you did last fall in the Building for the Generations vision. And we're going to make sure that not only is our generation cared for, we're not neglecting my generation, please, but we're going to make sure that the Roscoe's of this world and the Daniel's of this world, we didn't plan for those guys to be on stage today when I was sharing this message, but that's what it's about until Jesus comes. The vision of making sure that we're healthy and ready to reach our children and our grandchildren our great-grandchildren for the cause of Christ. Ultimately, Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I beg you, bring your very lives as an act of worship. It's reasonable. It's appropriate. He's earned it. Prayerfully consider where you are. And as we share some of the principles during this series about how to get to the place where you can be as generous as you want to be. Settle in your heart the level you want to be at. What's your next step? And then apply those principles so that you can get there. Let's make it real practical, okay? Can I pray for you? Father, thank you for these men and women. For every age that represents in this room, for every socioeconomic group, for every ethnic group that's represented in this room and online, we thank you for every one of them. We thank you for the privilege that we have to come together as a body, to link arms, to bring glory to your name. We're thankful that we can unite our resources for common purposes, again, for your glory. And I pray here and now, right in this moment, that you'd help each of us to do an honest evaluation of where we are, what level we are on as givers, even as you demonstrated that you are a giver and give us the faith, the grace to move to the next level. For your glory and to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name. Keep your heads bowed for just a minute. I'm not going to belabor this point or drag this out, but I do want to ask you to pray a prayer with me this morning in the privacy of this moment. I mean, the altars will be open in a moment. Our prayer team's here. Maybe you have a need. They would love to pray with you. Maybe you can't see your way to move through the levels of giving because you need so much physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. Uh, our team would love to pray with you this morning. We're here to meet needs, ultimately to help you be strong. But for many of us, here's a chance to pray sincerely. Would you join me in that prayer? God, show me where I am, the level of giver that I'm at, and then give me the faith and the knowledge to take the next step to your glory. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you guys.